As a kid, my favorite comic strip was Calvin and Hobbes. For those of you not in the know, the strip centered around a boy named Calvin and his stuffed tiger slash imaginary friend named Hobbes. Now there were a couple story arcs in this series involving the family going out camping into the woods, and Calvin hated it. There was no TV and things were just boring to him. I remember feeling a similar way about camping in the outdoors when I was a kid. I mean, I was raised by technology. Let me know if you could relate. But you know, as I grew older, I began to see a lot of value in nature. I've been on many hikes, I enjoy fishing, and my girlfriend's been wanting to catch the sunset up on a crest. So I'm adding that to the to-do list. Now, what if there's a philosophy out there that gives nature the respect it deserves? A philosophy that not only emphasizes nature, but also notes the important relationship between nature and the individual. Well, today we're going to be looking at the famous essay Nature by Ralph Waldo Emerson, and we'll see if we can find that nature-loving philosophy. Hello and welcome to Philosophy Tunes, the channel that seems to do a lot of American philosophy for some reason. I don't know, it just turned out that way I guess. But I do mention that because Emerson is a bit of a free-spirited trailblazer here. I mean, we're all familiar with philosophy that's come out of Europe and Asia, but when Emerson was writing in 1837, this was just 61 years after America declared independence. So there wasn't much American philosophy really sprouting up. We were still vibing with philosophical traditions coming out of Europe. I mean, hell, John Locke might as well have written our founding documents. But Emerson, the independent individualist, is out here trying to be original and not just follow in the footsteps of the past. This is what he says in the introduction to nature. Why should we grope among the dry bones of the past, or put the living generation into masquerade out of its faded wardrobe? The sun shines today also. There is more wool and flax in the fields. There are new lands, new men, new thoughts. Let us demand our own works and laws and worship. Sounds very Nietzschean. Speaking of which, check out my friend The Living Philosophy's video on Emerson and Nietzsche. Good stuff. Anyways, with this pioneer mentality in mind, let's head right into the essay. And what better place to start than to define what nature even is? Emerson is going to recognize both the philosophical definition of nature and the common sense definition of nature. He's going to use the word nature in both senses throughout the essay. Philosophically considered, the universe is comprised of nature and the soul. Strictly speaking, therefore, all that is separate from us, all which philosophy distinguishes as the not me, that is both nature and art. All other men in my own body must be ranked under this name, nature. Nature, in common sense, refers to essences unchanged by man. Space, the air, the river, the leaf. Now you may look at these definitions and strongly separate an individual from nature, as if they were two totally separate things. However, it's a little more complicated than that. There is a certain connection that can be felt in nature when someone can almost become one with nature. At least that's what it sounded like from this quote. Standing on the bare ground, my head bathed by the blithe air, and uplifted into infinite space, all mean egotism vanishes. I become a transparent eyeball. I am nothing. I see all. The currents of the universal being circulate through me. I am part or parcel of God. Take note of Emerson saying that he becomes a transparent eyeball. That's a key point here. There's actually a funny little drawing of a transparent eyeball here, so you know, enjoy that. Let's break down what it actually means though to be a transparent eyeball so you can look like that. I'm sure you'll be turning heads and taking numbers when that happens. So transparent. Think about a transparent piece of glass. The glass in a way becomes whatever is behind it. Like if you hold up glass to a red piece of paper, it turns red in your eyes. I think this transparent attribute of the eyeball is about blending into nature and becoming one with it, losing your egotism like Emerson says. Now the eyeball part is the absorbing part, observing and absorbing nature to take it all in. And oh man, there is a lot of nature to take in. So that's my interpretation of the transparent eyeball. Let me know what you think below. But now that we have an idea of nature and its relationship to the human individual, let's now look at these four uses of nature, for lack of a better word. So to help guide our discussion, Emerson lists out these four uses here. Whoever considers the final cause of the world will discern a multitude of uses that enter as parts into that result. They all admit of being thrown into one of the following classes, commodity, beauty, language, and discipline. So let's start with commodity because that's the easiest to explain. 
and it's also the first on the list, so I wouldn't want to weird y'all out by starting with the third or something. Anyways, commodity seems to basically refer to nature's ability to meet our needs. Beasts, fire, water, stones, and corn serve him. The field is at once his floor, his workyard, his playground, his garden, and his bed. All the parts incessantly work into each other's hands for the profit of man. The wind sows the seed. The sun evaporates the sea. The wind blows the vapor to the field. The ice, on the other side of the planet, condenses rain on this. The rain feeds the plant. The plant feeds the animal. And thus the endless circulations of the divine charity nourish man. I feel like this idea is better conveyed in Henry David Thoreau's book Walden, specifically the first chapter. We have a video on it here, so go check it out. But yeah, the section on commodity is not overly long and is pretty comprehensible. Beauty, on the other hand, oh boy. As if beauty wasn't complicated enough in our lives. This is pretty complex. Emerson divides the aspects of beauty up into three ways as it relates to nature. So the obvious first aspect of beauty looks at simply perceiving nature as something beautiful. This one isn't that complicated. We could see beauty in a lot of nature. I mean, every day we get the opportunity to see a sunset and a sunrise. I was in Ethiopia once and we hiked up this massive, massive mountain. Granted, it was pretty physically demanding. But once we got up there, there was this village near a cliff and oh man. Looking off that cliff so high up over the area was beautiful. Emerson's pretty poetic, so he's probably going to convey this idea better than me. I see the spectacle of morning from the hilltop over against my house, from daybreak to sunrise, with emotions which an angel might share. The long slender bars of cloud float like fishes in the sea of crimson light. Yeah, I also think that quote blew my Ethiopia story out of the water in terms of poetry. So moving on to this second aspect of beauty, wait, wait, wait. Just making sure we're on the same page, we're here right now. I know it might get confusing with all these subgroups. So the second aspect of beauty is this harmonization between the natural world and humanity. The presence of a higher, namely of the spiritual element, is essential to its perfection. The high and divine beauty which can be loved without effeminacy is that which is found in combination with the human will. So it sounds a little confusing, but stick with me. Emerson gives examples of these people throughout history, doing heroic acts within nature. It kinda sounds like how in film, having the characters act with no set doesn't work. Having a set with no characters doesn't work. But the character actions made in the set work. It's like in martial arts films, where the set can be used in interesting ways to add to the fight scene. But here's one of Emerson's examples. When Arnold Winkleride, in the High Alps, under the shadow of the avalanche, gathers in his side a sheaf of Austrian spears to break the line for his comrades, are not these heroes entitled to add the beauty of the scene to the beauty of the deed? So moving on to the third aspect of beauty, we have the world as an object of the intellect, to borrow Emerson's phrase. Now full disclosure, this is probably the one aspect I get the least. However, Emerson mentions this totality of nature, and I think that's what this section is about. The standard of beauty is the entire circuit of natural forms, the totality of nature. Nothing is quite beautiful alone, nothing but is beautiful on the whole. A single object is only so beautiful as it suggests this universal grace. This part is honestly a complicated read, so I'd recommend you guys read it yourself and let me know what you think this third aspect of beauty refers to. But now that we're done with that, we're done with beauty, and we can now move on to language. Now Emerson starts out by writing up what looks like a syllogistic argument, but doesn't work like one. One, words are signs of natural facts. Two, particular natural facts are symbols of particular spiritual facts. And three, nature is the symbol of spirit. So yeah, when I try to turn this into a logically valid syllogism, it doesn't really work out. But you still get the gist of what Emerson is saying here nonetheless. There's this spirit, and nature acts as a symbol for that spirit. And then words are used to symbolize nature. In this sense, it seems like nature does for spirit what words do for nature. So as to the first premise, I mean it's pretty straightforward and uncontroversial. We use words as a sign for things in the natural world. Do I... uh... Do I really need to elaborate on this? Uh, moving on. So premise 2 says that natural facts are symbols of particular spiritual facts. This is probably going to be the more complicated premise in this whole thing. And for those secular-minded viewers, this is also going to be a hard sell. So let's slowly walk through it. Emerson starts by comparing nature to states of mind. Every appearance in nature corresponds to some state of the mind. And that state of the mind can only be described by presenting that natural appearance as its picture. An enraged man is a lion. A cunning man is a fox. A firm man is a rock. A learned man is a torch. 
So here, Emerson is connecting us to nature, and he further does this later on. He's gonna talk about a universal spirit that embodies everything, us and nature. The universal soul he calls reason. It is not mine, or thine, or his, but we are its. We are its property and men. And the blue sky in which the private earth is buried, the sky with its eternal calm and full of everlasting orbs, is this type of reason. That which intellectually considered we call reason, considered in relation to nature, we call spirit. Spirit is the creator. Spirit hath life in itself, and man in all ages and countries embody it in his language as the father. So for me, I'm getting Spinoza vibes or even Taoist vibes from this. Obviously not exactly the same, but similar. So returning to the proposition, if we're all interconnected through the spirit, then nature tells us something about that spirit. This is said in the next premise, but Emerson mentions how nature has at times been used to tell these parables of moral truths, such as a rolling stone gathers no moss. Perhaps this is a more concrete example as to how natural facts are symbols for spiritual facts. Let me know what you think. As for the third premise, it's obviously pretty similar to the second, so I'll let you guys read into it if you want all the juicy details. But I will mention this one important quote that seems to tie the language section up pretty nicely. There seems to be a necessity in spirit to manifest itself in material forms. And days and nights, river and storm, beast and bird, acid and alkali, pre-exist in necessary ideas in the mind of God, and are what they are by virtue of preceding affections in the world of spirit. A fact is the end of last issue of spirit. And finally, 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 we have the last use of nature. Discipline. Now don't think of discipline as the discipline you learn when taking a martial arts class. Think discipline as in the discipline of psychology, like a field of study. Nature is a discipline of the understanding in intellectual truths. Our dealing with sensible objects is a constant exercise in the necessary lessons of difference, of likeness, of order, of being and seeming, of progressive arrangements of ascent from particular to general, of combination to one end of manifold forces. Now, this video is long enough, and I don't want to waste your precious time going in depth as to how nature can teach us stuff. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Emerson highlights differences as an example, like determining separation and gradation. There are tons of examples like this, and you know what? How about you guys do the work here? Comment below some insights that you've gained from nature. And with that, we are not done with the nature essay. You see, this is kind of a big one, so I'll probably have to cut it up into two parts. But hopefully this video is able to convey what Emerson thought of nature and the uses of nature. If you enjoyed the video, then give me a like, hit the bell, and hit the subscribe button. And with that, I wish you all a beautiful rest of your day.